know that the Bible says that God will never leave you nor forsake you? Isn't that good to know? Aren't you glad that you're not alone right now? Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you that you haven't left us alone or forsaken us. Sometimes, Lord, we may feel alone, but Lord, right now, your presence is invading our space, flooding our hearts and minds. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're with us right now, breathing life into us. Lord, turning the light on, your word, your plans and destiny for our life, and we receive it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Say amen. Amen. Thank God. You are born to win. That's our series. We're in part three of Born to Win, and this is so good. This is so you. This is all about God's destiny, His passport for your heavenly kingdom citizenship right now. Let's talk about Born to Win, part three. And the subtitle for this session is Born to Win, So Why Am I Losing? Mm-hmm. Good question, right? Born to win, so why am I losing? After part one of Born to Win, we were ready for more, and part two had us looking in the mirror of God's Word and seeing the reflection of His glory. Isn't that amazing? Yes, our self-portrait got a Holy Spirit makeover in God's seat of royal identity. The message of winning can be offensive when you feel like you're losing so bad. But that's the suffering that we're called to, to dare to believe in a good God and in a bad world, a great Savior in a devastating circumstance, to believe in love where fear and hate are just so prevalent. God is 100% winner, and the world without God is 100% loser. Only Jesus has triumphed over death, hell, and the grave. Isn't that awesome? Now that's the winner circle status. That's why this series is so important to you and me. Jesus unlocks your born to win identity, your citizenship. In this session, let's explore the biblical truth on born to win, so why am I losing? It was just shortly after Christmas 2012 when a homeless man was found dead under a Wyoming overpass. His name was Timothy Gray, and he had worked across the region as a cowboy on various ranches. The authorities said he died of hypothermia. Now, here's the rest of this important story. A year or so before this all happened, a New York heiress passed away, leaving a fortune to her nieces and nephews. The courts had been looking and trying to find Timothy Gray because his share of the fortune was $19 million. So a man dies under a bridge, freezing to death in the cold, while lawyers and officials hunt for a very rich man, Timothy Gray. Timothy could have bought just about any house or mansion, but because he didn't really know who he was, who his family was, he died under a bridge alone, cold, and hungry with basically $19 million to his name or in his account and not knowing it. Do you really know who you are? Do you know your true identity? And if you're a believer, a believer of Jesus, a person with faith in God, do you really, really know the benefits of kingdom of God citizenship? Do you? Ask yourself, if I'm born to win, why is it I keep losing? Why am I losing? Well, let me point you in the direction of Hosea 4 verse 6. God says this, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now think of this. God's talking and he says, my people are destroyed because of their ignorance of my will, of my kingdom benefits, of my word, of my promises. Now look at the specific reason why God had to send his son Jesus. Let's look at this. Galatians 4, verse 5, and then we'll skip to verse 7. Five, to purchase the freedom of, to redeem those who were subject to the law that we might be adopted, say that word, adopted and have sonship conferred upon us and be recognized as God's sons and daughters. 
Verse 7, therefore, you are no longer a slave, a slave to sin, but a son, a son and a daughter. And if a child of God, then also an heir through the gracious act of God through Christ. You see, the plan was always to liberate you from the law of sin and death, but not to stop there. See, so many people stop there. The rest of the plan was to give you identity as a son, as a daughter, a full heir in the family of God, an inheritor to the fullest degree. You see, that's what being truly redeemed means. Your family of God by faith, by believing. Still, you've got to know the will to get the will. Or let me say it another way. You must walk in the way of God to receive the will of God. The world says, what you don't know won't hurt you. Well, God calls ignorance deadly. That's what, what Hosea 4, 6 says. The world says, the truth will set you free. But that's not what Jesus said. Let's listen to what Jesus actually said in John 8, verse 32. He said, and you will know the truth. See, the truth passively doesn't set anybody free. Jesus said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth is legal. It's lawful. It has inherent power in it to produce. The truth is, you were made in the image of God, and that's why losing will never, ever be compatible with your design. It'll never make you happy or make God happy. Remember Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, lack of what they don't know. There are no points for ignorance. What you don't know is actually destroying your life. From the very beginning of time, the deceiver, the enemy, the devil, sowed doubt into human thinking over what God had said. The serpent sowed doubt into our great-grandmother Eve's heart in the garden. And he said, has God really said, did God really say? The enemy of our life works to normalize losing. It happened right from the Garden of Eden. Think of this. Kids playing in a sandbox. We've all seen that. Kids playing in a sandbox and some um, well-meaning adult tells them, well, it's not whether you win or lose, right, kids? It's not, but it's how you play the game. It's not how you win or if you win or lose. But children instinctively want to win. They want to be out front. They want to go faster to get the better truck. They want to get the bigger pile of dirt and sand. If they run a race, guess what? They want to win instinctively. If they get a Barbie, they want it to be the prettiest Barbie. Then some well-meaning adult comes along to moderate their expectations, yes, to help them adjust to worldly thinking and not get their hopes up and not see life through the lens of excellence or more or positivity. But it's not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. Really? Really? Have you ever seen someone fighting for their life in a hospital room? Doesn't it matter if they win or lose? Your health doesn't matter. Your marriage, the outcome doesn't matter. Your destiny, your legacy, your influence, it really doesn't matter. Your mortality. You see, we adopt these dangerous worldly ideologies to ease the pain of loss today to mitigate our dashed hopes for tomorrow. But for tomorrow, we have unintentionally settled on a perpetual cycle of hopelessness, loss, failure, poverty, addiction, and yes, death. Well, you can call it humility, but really we dishonor and disrespect our design when we tell ourselves winning doesn't matter. The enemy is counting on us forfeiting knowing the truth, knowing the truth for his game of believing the lies. Families are in crisis. People are dying, my friend. Marriages are failing every day. Children are being abused every minute. It's obvious to anyone being honest that winning, winning matters. We can make excuses all we want, and yet God's standard the manufacturer's standard is 100% winning. Sometimes you've just got to ask yourself, so, so how's that working for me, right? You're doing it your way, and yet you're losing. Well, how's that working for you?
How's your opinion holding up with all the real outcomes? How is your way, your insisted way working out for you? When you're honest with yourself, you realize winning matters. The welfare plans of socialist benefactors are all historical tragedies, aren't they? Why does every new generation think that playing stupid games today won't still win stupid prizes tomorrow? History repeats itself. Jesus gives codes and algorithms for the overcoming life to those who embrace truth and know their identity, their citizenship. Those who are born to win don't tolerate ignorance of the will of God. When you're born to win, you want the codes, the keys, the algorithms of your heavenly citizenship. Otherwise, how can you expect to inherit the will? Look, here's what Jesus says in this context. Matthew 16, verse 19. He says, I will give you the keys. He's not talking about these old ancient chain keys. He's talking about codes. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Jesus is saying the citizens of God's kingdom get all the keys and the codes to the kingdom. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 33. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This is kingdom talk for the citizens. It's not religious talk. Could this be why you're born to win and asking yourself, why am I losing? Life requires spiritual codes and keys. Jesus promised he'd give us all the algorithms of life. Are you actively seeking first, top priority, the codes of life from God's laws of life? Imagine if Timothy Gray had just did a little bit of seeking, a little bit of looking into who he really was, what really belonged to him. Remember, God's word in Hosea says that people die for lack of knowledge. Getting answers is for winners. We all need to back ourselves up against the straight edge of God's word, his truth, and ask the hard questions. Allow me to give you a simple everyday example for using codes. I think you'll get this. Think of an ATM machine and your four-digit code, your PIN. Have you noticed how discriminant those ATM machines are? Why do they insist on you having the correct numbers? What if we got at least three out of the four correct? Shouldn't we get access with just three out of four? Shouldn't we be able to get a few dollars anyway? Of course, you want your bank to be very discriminant with your account and access to your money, don't you? You don't want just any number getting results. And yet that's the way people often think God's kingdom system should be. Oh, well, because of grace. Oh, well, God should know what I mean. God knows I didn't mean it that, but you know, this is what I really meant. Well, he knows my heart. So, so it all will just kind of work out somehow by the grace of God. Are you kidding me? You'd never justify getting the fourth number wrong on your ATM pin. You know that's not winning, and it's completely incompatible with truth. The truth will be honest with you. It won't tell you, well, it's all right not to get all the code all right. The truth will say, God's plans for you are good, not bad. Plans to get the four-digit number correct. The grace of God helps you get the number correct, not wrong for the rest of your life. See, that's hopeful. That's a good future. That's real life living. In part one and two, we hit a few good summaries based on God's truth. We learned that even God can't take us beyond the limit of our thinking. We also learned that there is a manufacturer's standard for your complicated, amazing design. That's right, you're made in the image of God and there is a manufacturer's standard. In Genesis 1.26, we learn that we're made in the image of God. That's truth, my friend. So again, ask yourself, if I'm truly born to win, why, oh why, am I losing? Let's not run from the question, but be encouraged to run after the answers. Look at what Jesus said to a group of people wanting an answer to a similar question that we're asking today. These were people who had lost so much and they wanted answers. They wanted the keys to their faith in God. Starting at Mark chapter 4, verse 23. 
If any man has ears to hear, this is Jesus talking. He said, let him be listening and let him perceive and comprehend. And he said to them, be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought you give to the truth you will hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. And more besides will be given to you who hear. Then verse 25, for to him who has will more be given. And from him who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away by force. Can you imagine Jesus running for political office? Vote for me. Him that has more will be given. Him that doesn't have even what he does have will be taken away. Talking about losing. You don't have, but even what you do have will be taken away. What? Are you a haver or a not haver? That's what Jesus is talking about. Do you recognize? Do you see? Do you know? Do you know the will of God? Do you approach God's kingdom laws as a citizen or as a religious devotee? Two different results, two different outcomes. Jesus is giving all of us a call to focus. You will always move toward the center, the destiny of your focus. To live blessed, you must focus on the promises of blessing. Jesus preached, change your focus. That's what repent means. Change your focus, he sang. Zig Ziglar, the famous author and motivational speaker, he said, you are what you are and where you are because of what has gone into your mind. You can change what you are and where you are by changing what goes into your mind. And I can even take it to another level, what goes into your heart. God's word tells us that there is only one thing we need to concern ourselves with. Jesus said, seek first. You will never possess what you are not willing to seek first. Jesus' constant cry is, to him or her that has ears to hear, let them hear and understand. Hear what? The will. The will of God. The law of God. What really is the call here in Mark chapter 4? Jesus is saying that what you know or what you don't know is the difference between winning or losing. We talked about this in part two. What you look at and listen to determines what you believe. What you believe masters all your choices and your choices are the sum of your life. You don't have to be defined by your history or your present circumstances. Are you allowing the truth to shape you? Does truth have access to eliminate the stuff that doesn't belong and help you discover your identity to activate your true citizenship? Let's talk about the caterpillar. The caterpillar is kind of an ugly little fella, isn't he? Look at that. All he does is eat and eat and eat. And when the caterpillar is full grown, it stops eating and submits itself to the cocoon. It looks like nothing's going on for weeks and weeks, sometimes months. It's like the caterpillar died, but really it just ceases to be what it was. An amazing metamorphosis is taking place. Eventually, the beautiful adult butterfly emerges from its tomb of transformation as a new winged creature ready to fly far above the paths of the sluggish caterpillar, what it used to be. You're destined to fly, my friend. Yes, you may be crawling like a caterpillar today, but your DNA testifies that you're born to fly, to soar. But we all must submit to that one focus that has transformational power. We all need that amazing metamorphosis to stir up true identity. Paul wrote this to the Romans, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Romans 12, verse 2. I love this verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, proving what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Are you conforming or transforming? Are you off in a state of dormancy or activated? Conform means to take the shape of something, but still stay the same. You, you haven't changed. You're just taking the shape of something. Transform means to undergo a metamorphosis. You're no longer the same anymore, not the same creature. Have you adjusted to the disappointments of life? Have you adjusted, take the shape by just coping with the pain, the hurt, the loss? 
It's natural to want to move away, distance yourself from the pain, but conforming doesn't activate your design. Conforming actually weakens you and short circuits God's great plans for your life. It's been said that many abused people would rather live in a known hell than an unknown heaven. Their fail switch is jammed in their mind. They believe, therefore they are. 2 Timothy 3.5 talks of a spiritual form that actually denies the power of God. Life is in the off position. The apostle Peter had these wounds in his heart after he betrayed Jesus at Jesus' trial and deserted the Lord during the crucifixion. After Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he asked Peter, do you love me, Peter? Do you? He asked him that three times the same amount of times that Peter had denied Jesus publicly at his trial. Jesus wasn't trying to shame Peter, but he was using the truth to extract the poison darts of deception, of accusation lodged deep in his heart. Knowing the truth makes you free. It sets you free. Jesus wants to heal your wounds today. But we must return to the place Jesus won his championship, the cross of Christ. His victory is our hope. Come to the cross. That's where Jesus approved and ratified your adoption papers. Because of Jesus, you get all the rights and the privileges of a child of God. Don't walk to school in the rain when your father has provided you a ride. Don't go hungry when your heavenly father supplies all the food in the whole world. Don't go lonely. Don't try to invent your own way. Don't rely or trust in your own heart, but trust in the Lord. You're born to win in Jesus' name. So if we're going to honestly answer the question, so why are we still losing? Why am I still losing? We take hold of the truth, like Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Many times I've had to say to myself, that's me, that's me. You have to be diligent to know. To know is to have the will of God. God's will is your prosperity. It's your passport to eternal living. So not having or not knowing his will is, it's losing. It's failing. Yes, it's destruction. Look again at John 1 verse 12. But to as many as did receive and welcome Jesus, God gave the authority, the power, the privilege, the right to become the children of God. That is to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name, the family name. This is God's will, and it's telling us something far, far greater, better. Being born again is activation as a citizen of God's kingdom. Now that's being born to win. We're all born into this lost, broken world. God's perfect design, but born in sin. If we remain in a state of being born of earth only, then we never get our spiritual design unlocked from that dormancy sin puts us in. Look how Jesus answered an influential spiritual leader 2,000 years ago, John 3, starting at verse 5. Jesus said, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, unless a man is born of water and even the spirit, he cannot ever enter the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh, of the physical is physical, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Believing on Jesus, you're born of the spirit. You see, the mistake many people make is to think that that's religious talk. It's not. It's kingdom of God talk, and Jesus is telling this leader about the need to immigrate to be born into, born nationalized, to be immigrate into kingdom of God citizenship. Jesus is saying, born of water makes you an earthly citizen, but with zero access to God's kingdom. Understand that? Earthly citizenship can never appropriate the codes and the keys of heavenly accounts where unlimited supply for life remains out of evil's reach. We're all locked out without the proper passport. When you're born of the Spirit, you now have dual citizenship. You're an earthly citizen, but way more importantly, you're a kingdom of God citizen, benefiting from the constitution of the king. 
Your kingdom of God passport gives you legal and constitutional access to the keys and the codes of God's kingdom. It's not a religious thing. It's a legal matter. This is why too many people who claim to believe in Jesus but view his word as a religious book struggle so badly to get answers, answers to their prayers and struggle with the question, if I'm born to win, Pastor Stephen, why do I keep on losing? You see, the Bible is the law of God. It's the it's a book of God's laws. That's royal legal decrees, not a book of religious devotions. Yes, you're born to win, so work your legal identity and kingdom passport. Jesus authorizes you with keys so your child of God's status is operational as a full citizen of God's kingdom. Now that's weighty. In God's family, you have all access to the family codes, accounts, and blessings. You're a citizen of God's kingdom of heaven. What? Look at what God's word says in Ephesians 2 verse 19. Therefore, you are no longer outsiders, exiles, migrants, and aliens excluded from the rights of citizens, but you now share citizenship with the saints, God's own people, consecrated and set apart for himself, and you belong to God's own household. Oh, my friend, God loves you. You're born to win, and the greatest proof of that is how much God dearly, dearly loves you. Remember what Jesus said to us in John 17, verse 23, that Father God loves you, that's right, you, with the same love that he loves his own precious son Jesus with. You're loved. That's unfailing. That's amazing grace kind of love. Don't waste another day believing lies about yourself. God has willed to you his winning status. It's your inheritance in him. Here's the catch, though. You have to be his child. It's a matter of identity. It's a matter of royal citizenship. You must exercise your delegated authority, your power of choice. You gotta choose. You get what Jesus deserves, child-favored status, when you choose him, when you accept him. But winning must be your choice. You must choose Jesus even though he's already paid the price for you. There's a wonderful, powerful prayer in Ephesians 3 that I believe would be perfect for you and I to pray in this moment. The words will come up on the screen, so please feel free to pray this along with me out loud. We bow our knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would grant us, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto you, Father, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Unto you be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.